Good day, Sherry. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me over Skype. Um, I want to let the audience know that uh, we go back a little ways. We met, I think it was in ISPI back in the late 90s. But then we got a chance to spend five months working together on a project back in 2005. Um, but the, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and let us know where you live and work and what kinds of things you do and perhaps tell us a little bit about some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Cherie Wilkins. I live in Delaware and I work just about anywhere, at least I, I have, although currently most of my work is um, Washington, D.C. based. Um, so since 1995, actually, is when I got started in, in uh, performance improvement as, as a consultant, uh, working with Gary Rumler. And in terms of, I have, I work across industries, I work um, across levels, so, you know, human performance, process performance, whole organization performance, whole organization transformations, um, so you can't really say that I specialize uh, in any one particular area, although I did spend a good portion of my career working on management systems and measurement and, and kind of that kind of thing. Um, but you know, kind of been everywhere, banking, uh, you know, patrol, dig, digging for oil, <laughs> so, uh, governments, uh, just about everything. And, and that's actually been a, honestly been a, a real privilege to be able to take a peek inside of industries and, you know, put on a totally different hat and, and get immersed in another, another world really. Um, so that's, that's kind of the breadth of what I've done in terms of more interesting projects or, or kind of very interesting projects. Um, I would have to say some of those were my, you know, oftentimes you're only with a client for two or three months uh, five months in our case of, of the project that we did together, but I have had the extraordinary luck to uh, stay with some clients for two, three years, and there you're really engrossed in a whole organization transformation and able to um, stick around and really see the results, the benefits, and, and how it fundamentally really has changed the business. Uh, and I did, I had the... Um, opportunity to do that with a bank in uh, North Carolina, um, a trust company that was, that was probably, they were probably my all-time favorite client, where we built, um, we defined the processes for the entire organization and built a management system for the entire organization, which was really fascinating to be able to do it soup to nuts, literally everything wired together. It was just really rewarding. Um, and that was at a time when we were testing out a lot of Geary's measurement and management methodologies. And so this was really a beta, kind of beta test of, of bringing it all together as a full methodology. Um, and so that was, it was exciting. It was very, very exciting. Um, I also had uh, two very long stints, if you will, uh, within IT organizations. Um, which was also just really a privilege to kind of really understand because, as you know, uh, performance improvement kind of got its genesis and start in, you know, the training organizations and the quality organizations and all of that, but then moved, you know, there were there was a conf confluence. Actually, Paul Harmon has a wonderful diagram about how kind of all this stuff comes together, but there was you know, movement in the IT realm as well. And so then they sort of came t to the party and uh, Geary wanted to understand that world better because he was clearly from the ISPI kind of school. Um, and so he sent his son, Rick Rumler and I off into the IT world to really go to school on IT uh, and then figure out how all the methodology works there, how to you know, get that um, to be a much more seamless kind of a partnership and then bring that back uh, so that, you know, so that our stuff, if you will, worked 
well um, in terms of process improvement and, and performance improvement um, run by or, or launched by IT. So I did, uh, I was with a, probably a whole year um, transforming an IT organization within an insurance company and then um, another one in a building products company and that one was actually down in Mexico. So we spent a two years, I think, going back and forth to Mexico and, and really immersed with that organization, which was a global organization. So it took us to Switzerland and Mexico and Madrid and lots of other places. And so those two were, again, fascinating from the perspective of being able to learn stuff and beta test and apply, you know, methodology, change the methodology to be more appropriate uh, to work under those kinds of circumstances. Um, so I would, you know, those were probably the highlight projects, I would say. And again, you know, longer, so you, you get to stick around and, and really, uh, really see the results. Very good. Thank you. That's very cool. Can you tell us a little about your first exposure to human performance technology or whatever, however you refer to it? And tell us a little bit about where you came from in your early career and how you you know, entered into this world. We've talked about this a little bit before. and I Yeah, yeah. You know, you know it was a series of left turns. Yeah. So, yes, but very good. Um, so here's here's the, the true confessional, right, is that, um, you know, a lot of us who ended up in this field didn't start out. And everyone always asks me, you know, where'd you get your MBA? And I don't have an MBA. Um, so so uh, I was... I actually have a degree in German language and literature and another degree in communications, um, graphic design, marketing kinds of stuff. So, um, so I was working in the world, in the communications world and, and, um, you know, a series of left turns there, but I kind of ended up doing communications consulting for organizations that were undergoing change. So major transformation and in supporting that. And so where I actually sort of made the step over into performance improvement was kind of a two-step. For one, I would get asked in uh, to an organization uh, to deliver a solution. They were asking for a solution. So they were asking for a brochure, a, a report, a uh, you know PowerPoint series, et cetera, that they viewed as a solution to a business problem. And I'd get in there, and my job was to just, you know, take the specs and make the thing and give it to them. And, you know, often like being asked to create a training program. It wasn't training. It was all communication stuff. But but I realized, I just, I was like, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So I can make sure that my solution actually solves the problem. And, and quite often I would um, shoot my wallet <laughs> to pieces uh, by suggesting that the ex highly expensive, beautiful thing that they were asking for um, was not actually going to solve the problem. And that, in fact, what if we just went and met with this group and talked with them about, you know, had a little frank dialogue might actually solve our problem you know, more effectively. So I, and I was continually frustrated by that and and had no no knowledge of or experience in HPT or the rest of the, this uh, performance improvement world, but uh, I was working at the firm that I was working at had the account that was responsible for producing all of the documentation related to a series of process improvement projects and business assessments that were going on at DuPont Corporation, and all of those projects and all of that methodology turned out to be the Rumler Brace Group. So Gary and Alan, Gary Rumler, Alan Brace were running the organization. They had consultants running all over DuPont. They were training a lot of internal consultants at DuPont. And we were producing the process maps, the business assessment models, the super system maps, you know, all of the deliverables from those projects. Well, like any good manager, I had a series of folks working for me producing these things, but I didn't really quite understand what they were. You know, they came in sticky notes and big paper and all of that. And we're just making them look pretty and, and doing them in Adobe Illustrator and other software. 
I wanted to understand what we were doing so I could make sure that we were doing them accurately and that they were, in fact, communicating because they were clearly there were models that were trying to communicate something. I wanted to make sure they were ac- accurately communicating what they were supposed to. And so I asked how I could get a better handle on that. And they suggested that I read the book. <laughs> and by the book, I mean improving performance, managing the white space on the organization chart, um, which I have lying around here somewhere. But anyway, um, so I read Gary's and, and Alan's book. And like everyone else just about who read that book, had the honest to God, oh, that's how organizations work. That's why people do the dumb things they do. And, and just, it was, it was an epiphany. I got very excited by it. And, uh, and then, um, so I understood what I was doing. And so, um, very quickly crossed a line or two and had the audacity to suggest to these, (laughs) these uh, consultants that were running around, uh, in DuPont that, Hey, what if you did it this way? Wouldn't that be more effective? And what if you showed this another way? And, and, uh, and we got the reputation very quickly of being very good at producing the models and things for them because they were very accurate. And in fact, we were making suggestions. So that led to an invitation to dinner and drinks uh, with some of the RBG consultants who then suggested they were going to um, move my name further along. And, and then next thing I knew, I, was, I had two horrible interviews um, And I I don't mean that the interview itself was horrible because I honestly have no recollection of what I said in either of those interviews. But one was in a bar with a band that was too loud. That was my interview with with Gary Rumler. And the other was in a hotel while a bunch of people that had gone through Rumler Brace training were sitting at a long table all having lunch together. And they were staring directly at Alan Brace and I, who were sitting at a table for two conducting an interview and the hotel was so cold I was using the tablecloth to warm me to keep from shaking and looking too nervous so and those two interviews ended up in my joining Roma Brace group and becoming a consultant um, and my particular job was working with Geary on uh, at that point we were the real focus was measurement and management and management systems performance plan performance managed and all of that um, and that's where I started out kind of working on those and beta testing. So that's that's how I got into this world. So left turn, left turn, left turn. Um, and then when I think back on it, because everybody says, how the heck did you get from you know, visual communications to, to business consulting? Um, a big, big piece of what we were doing was modeling organizations and making it very clear how the system worked together. And so... To me, it makes a lot more sense than I think, you know, anyone else hearing the story. So. Yes. <laughs> Very <laughs> interesting. I, I, yes, everybody's gotten into this business, most people anyway, through a series of left turns, as you said. We even had in Rumler Brace, we had a former priest as a consultant. Um, you know, we have, we have people come from all different backgrounds and you just never know, you know, what's the particular strength that you have that you'll be able to apply. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other people or books or articles that were influential for you besides uh, Alan Brash and Gary Rumler? Who else, you know, made an impact on you that uh, you could share with us? So very early on uh, in my, um, well, almost, I think the first week or so that I was with Gary one of the first things he did for me is um, he sat down and he drew on a, on a literally on a cocktail napkin, um, because I think we were at dinner at the time when he did this out in Tucson, where he, he lived and worked for the last. Um, he, he drew the genealogy, if you will, of performance improvement. I, that's the best way I can describe it. Mm-hmm. But it was uh, who he had studied with and worked with in Michigan and then who they had studied and worked with 
and and so on. And it it was all back traced back to B.F. Skinner. So, um, and and went through all of the names that you know you the big names that everyone associates with with the early stuff. And so, um, I said, okay, I don't know anything about this world, so what should I read? And so he literally picked off and, you know, I read some Skinner and I read, uh, you know, just went through and, and read uh, articles and books by all the folks down through George Ordiarn and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and all the, the folks. Um, but, and then he suggested some other books and some of the other ones that he suggested were, um, wildly became some of my favorite books so i mean if i whenever anybody asked me um and bear in mind this is because i came from such a foreign world to this where i am now um understanding wheelers understanding variation uh the key to managing chaos i think is what it's called but it was a great uh dive into statistics and 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 you know what you, you manage what you measure. And if you can't measure it, you really can't manage it. And, and uh, that sort of, you know, became transformational for me. Um, understanding economics or I, the basics of economics. Um, I, oh, I can't recall the author right now, but it, it's right behind me. I'll pull it out in a minute. But um, uh, let's see, the goal, you know, um, everyone knows that one, goal rat. And, and the goal was, uh, again, it just was the, I, yeah, I get it. I understand it. That's how it works. That's what we need to do. Uh, kind of a book for me. Um, <laughs> and other books that, that Gary had me read that I normally would not have read. Um, what, so um, Moneyball, just because of the whole you know, measurement. I mean, it was baseball. I'm not the person to read a baseball book. But in the end, I absolutely loved it because it was literally about managing um, so a lot of a lot of the books that really have influenced me have that kind of a bend where it's about managing performance because you're measuring and you're you have feedback and and you're you're able to make those adjustments. So and then you know every paper Gary ever wrote became a part of my curriculum um, as well. And and we had some very uh, good people who wrote um, as well. And then Paul Harmon's stuff you know kind of came into it and. Um, Alan Ramis, who was a, our partner, was a terrific writer. Um, so just I, I've been exposed to a lot of stuff. It's all been influential. It's all been great stuff. Um, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I hope that that helps others look towards some of those resources to build their own background in this methodology. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, can you share that with us? I can. Um, so, so uh, um, kind of working on two fronts at the moment. Um, and, and one is more my passion, but the other one, because the other one is just so broad. Um, but so currently... A lot of my work is around organization redesign, but doing organization redesign the right way so that you're actually not just doing boxology. Uh, you are thoughtfully redesigning the work system, if you will, so the whole process architecture and how you manage that um, so that on day one, when you have to pull the trigger on the new organization, you are functioning. Um, and you, that it's your uh, boxology, if you will, your organization structure is in fact supportive as it can be and not, does not get in the way of the work that you do. Um, that is big and broad and literally brings in every piece of methodology I've ever applied because you are working at all levels of the organization. You're doing some process improvement. Uh, process definition, you're doing pr whole process architecture definition, you are defining an entire measurement and management system, uh, you know, redefining management processes, 
uh, trying to align supporting functions and enabling functions um, to to the core business, if you will, uh, work value, creating work at the organization, uh, and getting down to job design, consequence system design. It is so big, you know, that, that um, and, and because it's so big and we have limited amounts of time usually to do this work, you end up being selective and trying to uh, go for the biggest bang for the buck and, and, you know, some stuff can trail uh, what needs to lead. Um, and, and you're working with leadership, but you're also working with, you know, subject matter experts way down in the organization. And it's a lot of balls to juggle, but it's, it's uh, very rewarding, um, uh, but big. But, and uh, so that's kind of, that's a lot of what I'm doing currently. But what I still have a huge passion for um, is this uh, aligning of supporting and enabling functions to the core business and helping people get a better grip on uh, HR organizations, IT organizations, finance organizations, um, you know, logistics, etc., that are viewed as support functions um, and and the way in which they go about interacting with the business. And a big passion of mine is around the lack of an agnostic front-end analysis for any of these um, improvement or uh, um, enabling organizations. Um, we have a ridiculous system where we depend upon a business manager uh, and leadership to know what solution they need to solve the problem before they can go and find the solution provider. So you have to already know or think you know that what you need is some changes to your IT system or a new IT system because you have to then go out and go seek your IT partner to get that done or you have to already know or think that it's a human resource problem uh, and then go seek out the appropriate person. You know, within human resources, you have to know that it's compensation that's out of whack or lack of resources that's out of whack or it's a people problem, behavior problem or, you know, or it's they don't have enough training to go and seek your solution. And then we as the solution providers, um, you know, we we take it in and just like my, uh, you know, bring me a brochure that will solve my business problem. Uh, we go in and, and uh, you know, we have a hammer, so we're going to deliver a hammer. Uh, and we don't really have a good front end agnostic that um, we could say, hey, yeah, you might, my hammer might be good for you, but let me tell you that you could use a little wrench from over here and some screws are loose over there and, <laughs> Etc. And so this whole notion of all of us enablers and supporters and improvers uh, collaborating together with an agnostic front end so that we can actually solve business problems, real business problems, which most often need more than just one tool to fix. Um, and that's an area of passion of mine. Uh, so I, I am seeking out places where I can make that happen. Excellent. Thank you. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us uh, perhaps what you are currently focused on for your own learning or if you're accomplishing that through your writings or can you share any uh, with our audience here what you're currently focused on looking at besides what you just mentioned here about the agnostic uh, front end analysis? Yep, yep. So a big uh, portion of my personal learning at the moment is I'm uh, because I'm involved in some really big, big transformations, um, whole organization kind of thing, and I'm partnering up with uh, change management consultants because uh, people are very afraid to take on transformations that are that huge um, without having some backup, uh, they view as backup on the change management side of it. Um, and I've always felt that a lot of our methodologies have a lot of change management. You know, it's, it's, it's human engineering, right? right? So we're engineering things to happen in the right way. And 
uh, Alan Ramis uh, did a just a bang up job defining um, implementation methodologies for for um, Rum Liberation and later on Performance Design Lab and and so I've and a lot just there's a lot of uh, what I view as change management tactics and considerations built into that. But um, in collaborating with these change management uh, folks who are coming at it from a different perspective, a lot of my learning right now is on how uh, how to build that into the project at at the right points um, so that you have really engaged the hearts and minds of the organization on the whole journey. Um, so, and it's been interesting collaborating with them. So. Trying to, yeah, you know, we're sharing back and forth and trying to see how we can do that better in these large transformational efforts. And so, whether or not we'll write an article on it, I couldn't promise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it depends on how busy we get, but um, but that's that's an area where I'm I'm uh, learning and still going to school on things. Of course, I I'm going to school every time I hit a new organization. So, mm-hmm. thank you. Uh, shifting gears a little bit here, um, one of my standard questions uh, in these uh, HPT video interviews is, is there a favorite HPT or other term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Um, something that you feel perhaps is not used consistently or that you'd like to twist the phrase a little bit and uh, give us your take on that? So, um, for the bulk of my work, I would say, and a lot of it is because it has to do with management of, of work, um, process, business process has been a term, and, and there's been lots of writing on this, and, and actually some of it quite funny, uh, about how you define what a business process is, um, and so... We at, at Performance Design Lab, even though we originally, at, you know, Gary and Alan originally threw out a, a, a definition of process um, back in the early days, we redefined it, and it had something along the lines of, first of all, it is a construct. You, you are, as a business, are making a conscious decision of where it begins and where it ends, and, and it's, a, it's a decision, so it's a construct. Um, and... And we defined it such that it uh, included all of the work to get to, um, you know, the value creating work so that provides ends in a value point and that it could be performed effectively and efficiently and it could be managed effectively and perhaps provided competitive advantage. I think all of that is, is still very relevant, but what for me has become critical in my work and transformational in my work is that notion of the end point being that it is literally all of the work to get to a significant value transformation. Um, And by defining their process architectures in that way, they fundamentally shift how they view their organization. And so even my current client, um, you know, by by getting them to recognize that we're working on some enabling processes, by getting them to recognize that the end point is not, you know, a person who's been through um, you know, human resources. You're, you got someone onboarded, right? So uh, the end point is not, oh, they've been through the training because then, you know, that that onboarding department is done with their work. And we said, no, isn't a better end point that that person is ready to work? So if they're ready to work, they can get in and out of the building, right? They have their security clearance in place. They have all their computer access. Their laptop is sitting on their desk. Um, you know, they can log in, log out of things that they need to. Uh, in addition to they've, you know, signed all the proper papers and they've been through the onboarding training that tells them how to get their paycheck, et cetera, and, and you know, and they're ready to work. And if you don't coordinate all of that, then you have somebody sitting there who's, yeah, I've been through onboarding training. I can't do anything. I can't get in and out of the building. I can't get on my laptop. I can't answer my email. What is the point of, of efficiently managing the onboarding process if you haven't reached that real transformational milestone? 
of ready to work. And so by, by changing up what, and I call them, you know, value milestones, but you can call them whatever you want, but those points at which a real transformation has occurred by changing those up and getting them to view that, you know, well, maybe we ought to consider managing all this work to get to that point and measure and manage that. And, oh, by the way, we could define that as a process and we could map it and all the right players would be in the room so that we could actually coordinate all of our activities to reach this significant point of value and it would benefit all of us. That has just blown the minds of leadership um, and caused them to fundamentally rethink how they're approaching work in their organization. So I think it's, it was that, that part of our new definition of process that um, I really would like to see people embrace. Um, and uh, because I think it, it makes process improvements so much more powerful than, than kind of the realm in which it got relegated in recent years. Thank you. That was, I, I really like that significant point of value and value milestones. Thank you. That's excellent. All right. Is there, um, so the last part of the interview here is where I'm looking for you to tell us some stories, stories <laughs> maybe about yourself and others, or just stories of others, uh, things that uh, uh, were impactful to you or interesting or funny, something that humanizes some of those that we've run into, that we've had connections with as we've uh, been in this world of uh, performance improvement work. And we've talked about this previously, so I know that uh, you are going to talk about uh, Gary Rumler and Alan Ramis and Paul Harmon and Paul Heidenreich and this group called the Tucson Seven but uh, I'll be interested to hear uh, what you have to say about them. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Rick Rumler. So not, not to yep. go in that order, but uh, what do you have for us? Okay. So um, first of all, I, I, you know, Gary, Gary was my, at various times, he was my boss. He was my mentor. Uh, he became my business partner and, and he also became a great friend Um so I was extraordinarily privileged to have that happen, and it really was, you know, by accident, as I've explained. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that that was a just a tremendous um, honor to have that experience. Um, so working with Gary was uh, he he was always learning, he was always teaching, uh, and but when you were with him. And you, he was thinking out loud, which he did on the whiteboard, as the infamous whiteboard. Um, you were, everyone that came in the room was welcome to get up, grab the marker, and engage in the thought process, the thinking out loud process. And he had a genuine, genuine desire to learn what you brought to the party, to to uh, understand where you, your perspective and where you were coming from and see if that fit into his model, where it fit. Did it change his model? Did it influence his model? Um, did it improve his model for how, you know, the way the world and organizations work? Um, and so I got to, so Gary found Paradise, uh, which was Tucson, Arizona, and, and that was, for him, paradise on earth. And, and so he convinced the family to move there and, and so on. And his wife, Margaret, and they built a lovely place out there. And it had a, a separate kind of a, a house uh, behind the main house that, that was Gary's office. It also was guest quarters. And that became, um, as he referred to it, his lab, right? It was, a, it was the performance design lab. That was the actual lab. Um, and he w he welcomed many people to come out. And my job, I spent probably a week out there every month for, I don't know, going on 10 years kind of a thing. So um, I, I was, uh, sometimes I stayed in, in the actual lab itself. Sometimes I was in a hotel nearby. But I spent a lot of time in that lab in front of that whiteboard and got to witness the comings and goings of all of those who were invited um, to, to come in and 
do this learning. The other thing that Gary, because at the time that he moved to Tucson, he was, you know, he was in his prime. He was, uh, he was uh, in his third quarter, as he put it. And he felt he had the privilege of not necessarily going out on all the projects in person. And, but that's where the learning was. And so he had a habit of, and it it's a, was a wonderful, wonderful thing where he would do the project reviews. You would invite the consultant. They would come. They would sit at the table. And then he would sort of interview them and get them to draw up on the board what was the situation at the business, what was the problem, how were they approaching the problem, We'd review the deliverables, and just the most rich, meaningful discussions going through these. And they, they do it at you know kind of the midpoint, and then they do it again at the end, project debrief. Um, and those were really where the richest learnings were. And they would often in, you know change up the methodology, influence, it, create a new tool, et cetera. And, and uh, I was privileged to sit through a lot of those. And so I heard a lot of the stories from the consultants. I got to see a lot of the learning. Um, he also was inviting other folks like the, and referred to the Tucson Seven. So this was a group of, and I'm not going to remember all the names. You might have to re- help me with some of who all was in it. Um, but these were uh, folks, very uh, prominent folks. Dale Brown was a part of that. Um, let's see. Um, well, yeah, yeah, Danny yeah. Langdon and Don Toasty and uh, Claude right. Lineberry and uh, Bob yes, Carlton, Bob was I think, part of it. and Roger Kaufman. Yes, yes. And so they would come out and uh, and he would have these meetings. Now, I was never, because I was not a part of the Tucson 7, I wasn't actually allowed in the room but I often heard the yelling from outside the door because they would, you know, they were coming from very different perspectives. Um, and Gary, you know, tried to, he partnered up with some of these folks on, on several occasions, like Bob Carlton and a lot of his, um, his uh, cultural assessment kinds of things. And, and he tried to partner up with, with him on methodology related to change and implementation and so on. And, um, and it, you know, it worked more or less. These were all very strong personalities mm-hmm. then when they got in the room and, and, uh, and, and Gary was always trying to model, right? So a big portion of it is if I can't draw it, I don't understand it. And, uh, and so they, they would get into these crazy conversations where there'd be a lot of dialogue and then Gary would try and draw it. And then there'd be arguments about the drawing and, <laughs> and, uh, so it was a lot of fun to just be the fly on the wall and listen to a lot of those. And then I'd get the debrief afterwards when Gary and I got back to work. So, um, so I got to witness that, um, uh, he did heated but interesting uh, exchanges uh, that he called the Tucson Seven and, and uh, as he invited others to come and then all of the consultants who came in. Um, so just then we would, um, one of the other things that Gary and I did a lot of was work on case, elaborate case studies. And a lot of people are familiar because they were trained um, using these case studies, but uh, the big ones were, you know, Ajax, BJAX and CJAX, and they, they, every one of them were a real company, but more often than not, they were a conglomeration of several companies with different issues that had been put together, and then we produced the deliverables and create the whole scenario of how they went through the whole improvement, um, and that was a big portion of my job was working on those case studies. But the original Ajax case study was done back in the days of Motorola. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the folks who uh, was key and instrumental in that was Paul Heidenreich. And so he had done a lot of the original deliverables. And and really to do these case studies, what you're doing is you're pretending you are the head of manufacturing at a company called Ajax or the head of sales. And you're remembering every sales guy you've ever met and every manufacturing guy you've ever met and trying to really get in the head and, and, uh, and, and writing down, you know, all of the details and, uh, you know, all the data related to that. And, uh, and Paul Heidenreich was referred to as the CEO of Ajax. Um, so 
uh, and he had successfully done that, but we needed to build the management system for Ajax. That's kind of the management system stuff lagged a little bit on the original process improvement methodology. And so Gary wanted me to work on the management system, but he wanted to convince Paul Heidenreich, who had since retired uh, from Motorola and was part of that whole original movement in Motorola, as you are well aware. Um, and he'd retired and he had a Winnebago and he was heading off to Cabo. He had a little casita down there and he and his wife were having a grand time. And Gary really wanted to get him working on Ajax. And he said, well, not yet, not yet. You know what we can get Paul, but not yet, not yet. And lo and behold, what it was is Gary was talking to Paul now and then and waiting until he heard Paul mention that he really needed something and it was something big and expensive. So the way we got Paul to come back to work and work with me on the management system for Ajax was when Paul needed new tires for the Winnebago to go down to Cabo. <laughs> and that was the thing that brought Paul back to the table was we were going to pay him enough that he could afford the tires he wanted, which were multiple, <laughs> you know, big, huge, expensive tires for his Winnebago. And then Paul came back and worked with me as the CEO. Uh, and we built out a lot of the Ajax stuff from there. Um, Great. <laughs> so let's see. I was going to talk a little bit about Alan Ramis. Um, Alan was a, he, I worked with Alan at, at, at Rumler Brace. In fact, he was the head of consulting at Rumler Brace. Um, he was in charge of all of us that were consulting uh, when I got there. And um, and then later on, Alan became a partner in performance design lab as well. So got to, uh, I was privileged to work with Alan for many, many, many years. Uh, and he, as I said, is a fantastic writer He's an amazing person. But the big lesson that I learned from Alan was um, he was the master at calling leadership on their BS. And, you know, I was a little scared to do that, but I witnessed Alan very successfully. Um, you know, you make the case for change, right? Mm -hmm. And then they begin to weasel word and they begin to hem and haw and, you know, and Alan was the master. And I, if you've ever seen Alan or you know Alan, he's he's not very big, but he with is, you know, and he's done some um, Western reenactments, right. you know, so that kind of um, Wild West look and and uh, but he could just glare at them with those intense eyes and put his fist down on the table and call them on their BS and say, and you know, threaten to walk out essentially um, and give them the ultimatum. And he was really good at that. He would give them the ultimatum that would make them cave and say, yeah, we have to fundamentally do this differently. And we, we got to sign up for this and we can't weasel out and, you know, do it halfway. And, and uh, that was a really, really, mm. uh, important lesson you know because you do you really do have to call them on their stuff yeah. and he was he was a master at that he was also you know he would you might get invited into a lower level of the organization but he knew how to get the issues in front of leadership and that 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 is what had to be done because they had to engage in the transformation and if they were not engaged in the transformation it was going to be a failure or a near failure a lot of activity, little result, and and uh, watching him do that, it kind of masterfully do that, um, was really a, a privilege and and one of the the big things that I learned from from Alan. I also um, was privileged to work with Rick Rumler, uh, Gary's son, and um, Rick was the master. So you know, Rick. <laughs> by virtue of birth, had been brought up with all of Gary's models and all of that. And so he knew them backwards and forwards and, and, uh, and he knew all of that. And yet still Rick could sit in the room with us and we're all talking and getting excited and it's all going this way and we're drawing the model and we can see it's so clear all of us. And then Rick would drop the bomb. <laughs> he would just say something from a whole nother perspective 
completely 100% valid, but it would just, you could just hear the fizzle <laughs> you know, of, of everything that we had just done because the ring dropped a bomb. And, uh, and, and he was right to do so. So, I mean, he's a, like his father, an extraordinary thinker and sees things from a million angles at once. And, and, uh, so I really enjoyed working with Rick. Um, not the least of which is Rick and I, we get paired up on these projects and, and some of them were the year long projects as we were going to school on learning, you know, IT organizations at, at the behest of, of, uh, Geary. And uh, so Rick and I, our food tastes were <laughs> right smack dead on. So we could, I could count on Thai and Indian hmm. on every project, no matter where we were, and and maybe some good Mexican. Mm -hmm. and, and never never was a hamburger eaten or anything bland. It was we were just uh, perfectly aligned on our tastes for going out on these projects. So I spent a lot of time with Rick and and uh, really enjoyed working on projects with him. Um, in terms of, uh, so these IT projects that we went to school, one of the things that Geary did, so I don't have a lot of familiarity with ISPI. I have not spent much time with ISPI. I'm, that's, that's really not the way to put it. I am very familiar with ISPI by virtue of association with all the folks in it, but, um, I wasn't very active in ISPI. In fact, I was barely active at all, um, because, we Gary split up all of the um, all of our focus in terms of all of the realms, the kingdoms of process improvement and and uh, performance improvement. And so there were those of us who were sent off to BPM land, and that was Rick and I. Um, so we we were really sort of assigned going to the all the BPM conferences and speaking there and writing for those forums and and. Uh, and so we spent a very, uh, very large amount of time and focus on, in that world. And um, in doing so, we got to work with uh, Paul Harmon and, and did a lot of things with Paul Harmon as well. And, and at one point, Geary and Paul attempted to write a book together, um, which did not work because um, they were coming at it from two different perspectives and, and where they were meeting in the middle wasn't to Gary's satisfaction. That was a, a part of why Gary sent Rick and I off into the um, land of IT to really understand IT better so that we could come back and speak Gary's language around IT, IT mm -hmm. or put IT into Gary language. Mm -hmm. and, and um, Because I think after we had done that, maybe the collaboration with Paul Harmon would have worked better. But um, so that was a book that never happened, but there was a lot of writing that went on. Um, so, so that was kind of a lot of my focus was spent in the BPM world and, and trying to make that work. And a lot of the struggles there exactly paralleled the struggles of ASTD and ISPI. Um, and, and that's where I think kind of this agnostic front end uh, came out so strongly for me because I, we could see the parallel struggles, um, and then you know the same at, at Sherm. You know, we had some some uh, touches with the folks in Sherm, and then all the experience with quality and Six Sigma. Um, you know, and and it's just you could see how we're all trying to work with the business and bring a solution, um, and and how you really needed kind of this agnostic front end so that you could be assured that you were actually delivering the solution solution that you needed. Um, so I spent a, a fair amount of time at those conferences and and working with folks from the BPM world as well. That, those stories are great. Um, it's funny, how, when you're talking about Paul Harmon, I'm thinking, well, he worked at Praxis with Tom Gilbert and Gary Rummer way, way, yep. way, 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 way back in the yep. day. Uh, he did. But as I guess we uh, diverge into some world here, what we learn and how we think of things. Uh, uh. Well, and he, he had already immersed himself in that world, mm -hmm. so much so that he could speak the language. And he was spoke, speaking to folks that weren't necessarily fluent in that world yet or didn't really understand exactly how that world worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a, there was just some more learning that had to go on before the collaboration you know, would have been effective. But, 
Um, so it just didn't didn't come to be. But but Gary did get immersed in in IT and how to make IT mm-hmm. work by virtue of of working through these projects. And we did you know, and you get into IJAX, right? Which is the case studies for that. So so um, yeah. So. It was, it was fun. Well, I'm familiar with some of those case study work, and, but I found these stories fabulous. Of course, I worked for nine months directly for Paul Heidenreich, so th- there are lots of stories about him. And uh, <laughs> The Tucson 7 group, that was funny because it was when I was uh, president of ISPI, and that particular group was complaining that they go to the conferences and there was nothing there for them. It was all for people mostly new to the organization. Yeah. Same old, same old. And I remember Roger Addison inviting Tim Eskew and I to the very first meeting of what became the Tucson Seven, And they were talking about what they wanted, and they agreed that they were all going to get together, and let's go to Tucson Geary's place because he's got a nice place where we can all meet. And so I was planning on going, and Tim Eskew was going to go. And then a couple weeks later, we got disinvited. (laughs) Because the group decided that what they really wanted to do was to fix ISPI as they thought uh, that yeah. it was not quite, you know, extending the and marketing well enough and, and, and sharing the methodologies and all that. And it was interesting that one of the things reported back to me about all of that, because I was very interested in what they were talking about uh, and agreed with, you know, their premise as they started, was that they ended up sh- mostly sharing with each other what they did and how they did it and what their models and methods look like. And that's, I, when you said that you heard a lot of the shouting, yes. that's what immediately came I, to I mind for me. I believe the shouting, like, so the sharing was all great. The shouting happened when they tried to create a model <laughs> or a picture of how it all fit together, mm-hmm. right? And they just couldn't get there. But, um, yeah. yeah, so don't feel bad that you were disinvited. <laughs> I was I was exiled from the room, you know, so... <laughs> Okay. Oh, great stories, great stories. Well, Sherry, thank you so much for agreeing to participate with me in this interview. And uh, as a wrap up, um, I, I hope that this is of interest to people entering the field, fairly new to the field here. And um, do you have any words of wisdom or suggestions for people who are just entering into this world? And what kind of guidance can you give them? Um, it sounds cliche but read 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 broadly Um, it always amazed and astounded me uh, you know where just the more I exposed myself to the, the breadth of what there is out there that I could find my way through all of it um and remember just the right stuff at the right time because I had exposed myself to it, or at least where I was able to interact uh, with, you know, another consultant or another methodology that we'd run into, you, get, you know, and and uh, and so I would just encourage those who are just starting out, you know, it's not enough to be an expert on your stuff. You really need to expose yourself to everybody else's stuff. Because you're going to run into it or you're going to run into the legacy of it. And so you need to understand how it connects um, or, you know, if it interferes, how how to get around that interference. Um, and that was I think that was a good uh, a good bulk of the reason why Gary had me read all these things because some of the stuff he had me read I was like why why did you have me read that and it's like so you had to recognize it when you ran into it because you're going to go to this company over here and they used to love it you know so um so yeah read read very broadly expose yourself um wider than what you think your niche is um because you are going to run into and have to connect to a lot of things in your career Thank you so much. Those are that's an excellent advice for all of us, even today. Those of us who have been around for a while. Again, thank you so much, Sherry, for for doing this with me. Have a great day. 